Thanks, colleagues. Welcome back after lunch. If we can settle down. I get a sense we might have lost a few people over lunch. And this is actually the most important panel, so I hope you're with us. So, colleagues, we're going to build on the panel that came before lunch that really spoke about the impact of COVID, and I think we saw some interesting data. But I'm going to push the panel on, and I'll quickly introduce them to you in a few seconds, although they don't really need lots of introductions, is to think a little bit about how do we go forward? So not only look at the current challenges we have, and of course the challenges we had before COVID have been exacerbated. We sat spoken over lunch and, and the real thing here is we've actually just, uh, and Nick, if I can quote you on that, we've just dropped a level as a whole country across all our grades. So what used to be grade four is grade three, and you can follow that analogy as you go on. So what we're gonna do as a panel, and I really try to, to influence the four panelists not to use slides, unsuccessfully okay so they are going to use slides but they promised me that they're going to use very few slides and perhaps keep it to five minutes each to allow us to interact a little bit more in terms of the conversation style so we'll see how it goes just quickly my panel so i've got my senior right on the left there um my senior is from maltino and i don't think my senior you need lots of introductions you've been part of the space for a long time and maltino plays an important role in literacy in our country thank you Chetty has kept his mask on, but the rest of us are not, so just stay away from us. Uh, Chetty's from the NECT, so Godwin Calza was going to be part of the panel, but Godwin had to go back uh, to Pretoria, to Joburg on an emergency. So Chetty, thanks for standing in, much appreciated. And Chetty will give us a sense from the NECT point of view of what's been happening the last while. Nongamsa, you don't need introductions today, like everybody knows you and you've been part of the deal. Ursula Hoadley, uh, seasoned research and education, doesn't need much of an introduction either. Seeing you for the first time in a couple of years, Ursula, but your research oh. precedes you. And so I think we're really in a good space. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask the panelists a couple of questions when they finish. So I'm going to quickly just give them a heads up on the questions. So the first question would be a little bit around the extent of the learning losses. So that we've already spoken about to some extent. Now the question will be, has it been more acute in the public system? than in the private system, and why? What decisions do we take? Do we need to take now to prevent further losses? It's a really important question. The last couple of weeks, uh, with rotational timetabling kind of phasing out, uh, I see some people in the audience that have been with me on this journey. With rotational timetabling phasing out, it's been too slow. And so the question from many of us that work in this space is like, hey guys, DBE, get your act together. Why is this going so slow? We heard from the DBE this morning uh, around a couple of things that have been happening. Uh, the one example I can use is the National School Nutrition Program. Do we really need to take each other to court to get things to happen? Like really? And so the discussion around the rotational timetabling was it's going too slowly and do we kind of need to go into that kind of process again? We had a few sage advisors who I'm not gonna mention by name and they said like the decision's already been made. It's the bureaucracy and it's gonna take time to change. And of course, I think yesterday, the day before yesterday, it's come through and we, we've got our ducks in a row now. The question really is for us is what is our response to COVID? How do we accelerate things? Because if we're going to be as good as we were before COVID, we're still a level lower than we were before COVID. So we've kind of got a problem here. So my challenge to the panelists would be to engage a little bit with the thoughts I'm putting out now. You can tell us a little bit more about what you're doing, but we primarily want to know from you is what are you doing to take us forward? You can tell us what you did during COVID, but the interesting question is what do we do as we go forward? How do we mitigate further losses? Our system has gone through a really turbulent time. I think we've learned a couple of good things. So we can talk about some positives that came out of COVID as well, particularly the use of data. But there are a lot of other things that are not going so well. And then the last question I'll ask you, and then I'm also going to be done, otherwise you're going to tell me I'm breaking my own rules, is um, I'm going to ask you just kind of for one recommendation to take the system forward. You can talk about it in your slides, or I can just ask you afterwards. All right, so we're going to go into the sequence, Ursula first, then Chetty, then Masenia, non Gamsu last, and then we'll go. If this was a virtual meeting, I would unmute my mic if you, if you need to get the signal that I need you to stop. Like, I don't have a mic to unmute in that way, so guys, just five minutes. Is that good? Ursula, are you going to set the standard for us? I will try. Okay, do you want to come stand here? Are you going to sit there? Whatever you feel comfortable uh, with. Yeah, I can stand. Ooh. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, um, so I'm going to speak very briefly um, uh, with the curriculum focus on, uh, on issues of recovery. So I've jumped over the question of learning losses, I think, but that's been dealt with in the previous session. Um, so during COVID, um, um, there were actually very minimal uh, curriculum uh, changes to try and mitigate um, losses and, and, um, and uh, facilitate catch-up. Um, the DBE published a trimmed ATP in 2020. There were very little changes there, apart from the integration of life skills into home language. Then later in that year, the fundamentals, sorry, I've got those foundations. Um, and then at the beginning of um, 2021 was the recovery ATPs. And in essence, these documents were very, very similar. There was, there was no content removed, I mean, apart from the life skills, but that was reinstated in 2021. Um, uh, the, the difference with the recovery ATPs was that three weeks were given at the beginning of the year to cover content from the previous year. Um, and given the, the, the extent of learning losses, um, it's clear how unrealistic um, that was. What catch-up strat strategies were there? There were no national programs, but there were lots of local initiatives. And a lot of those local initiatives involved uh, materials development, um, particularly to assist learners with remote learning those who were not uh, online. So what does the international evidence say about how, um, how, how we might go about um, catching up? The, 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 the biggest emphasis is, of course, around uh, instructional time and the need to try and uh, recoup, recoup some of the, the instructional time um, loss. The literature also says that there's a need to act very quickly because learning gaps increase and they compound over time, especially for um, the early grades and for the most disadvantaged learners. Um, there's an emphasis on the need for accelerated learning, in other words, to utilize uh, time in a different way. Um, there's suggestions around instructional content, like simplifying um, uh, curriculum, removing certain subjects, or suspending them at least, and focusing on foundational learning. There's quite a bit of emphasis on the instructional level, and that comes out quite strongly in relation to teaching at the right level. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, it's highly problematic in con conventional school systems, but it seems to have a lot of currency at the moment. Um, lots of stuff in remote solutions. We haven't had a good experience with that for the majority of learners. Um, a strong emphasis on assessment, particularly baseline assessment, and the need to figure out where children are, and finally attending to the psychosocial needs of learners um, post-pandemic. So these are some of the, the main sort of international uh, suggestions uh, that emerge. So I'm going to go out on a limb and, to, and make a set of recommendations, as, uh, as uh, James suggested. Um, but I think that there are certain key uh, um, uh, considerations before I talk through them. The first um, is that we actually have a very long school year and we know that we don't use time well. Um, extending uh, the, the school day or use, using utilizing school holidays is problematic um, and it's only beneficial if it's used really well. Um, utilizing existing materials is essential takes lots of time and money to, to, to develop new materials. And there is actually lots of material available. And, and a lot of material was also developed during, uh, during COVID. And it's absolutely essential that whatever decisions are taken regarding curriculum coverage, uh, catch up, that uh, instructions are simple and, and, and unambiguous. Teachers are actually, much like all of us having come out of 2021, exhausted and complex uh, requirements requiring that they, they again make school-based decisions um, around what to do uh, are unlikely to be welcomed. So these are my, I'd say they're suggestions rather than recommendations, but I can't get to them. Oh, there we go. Okay, so there are three things. The first is, uh, is around extending instructional time. We need to use the time that we have better. So in resuming the normal timetable, 
uh, that needs to be carefully monitored. Schools need to be given support to normalize routine bringing back absenteeism, utilizing some of the, some of the systems um, that Martin alluded to earlier, ensuring that there are no short days, there are no short Fridays, there are no short terms when, when exams start, and really trying, making a concerted effort in relation to time to making school happen regularly, routinely, and utilizing the full school day again. Um, in relation to reading the instructions specifically, yesterday there was a lot of talk about minimal resources and providing one-to-one one -one, uh, resources for each learner. And so, that, so providing every foundation phase learner with a Bula Bula uh, anthology is likely to make a difference. We have some local evidence for that in the Eastern Cape. Some work that I've been doing in Liberia shows a similar thing. One-to-one -one resources for learners does make a difference in and of itself. But we need to take it a step forward and make sure that those anthologies are um, utilized. Sorry, I missed that. We should, we should uh, uh, suspend life skills again. That life skills period should be used for the use of uh, those anthologies. Um, and so what, what, what we're trying to do then is increase what Kathy Russell calls uh, text experience. Learners must hold the anthologies must page through them, must read them either with their teacher or themselves. And then I think we should reconsider uh, the uh, education assistance. We've done it. We know how to do it. We do, it should be done during school term. Um, and and the, these education assistants should have two simple tasks. One is one-on-one -on -one reading with learners, particularly uh, um, learners who are struggling. Um, and this draws on some of the evidence around the reading recovery uh, programs elsewhere. Um, and the other is to manage a kind of a literacy boost in, 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 along the lines of, say, the children's program, where uh, material goes home every week with learners, 40 stories, once, one a week with four questions, and they come back. And that's something that, uh, that educator assistants could manage as well. So two simple tasks. Reading individually with learners can address some of the psychosocial issues as well, and managing a literacy boost. Uh, and that's it. Yeah. Am I back on? Thanks. Okay. I was going to stop you. We actually finished. Okay, very good. Um, I just want to ask you one question, Ursula. What's really worked well over the last two years? You've got some suggestions there for changes, but what has worked well? Um, well, I mean, there's, there's not, there's not a, that much current evidence because obviously yeah. those kinds of things are in progress now. But um, there's some evidence around these accelerated programs. So, for example, in Sierra Leone, they suspended a whole lot of uh, subjects and they compressed a year into two years, yeah. and that showed gains. Um, in other places, there's some success with certain forms of remote learning. So, a big TV um, uh, program in Mexico was extremely successful very big a single program i mean nick suggests that there should be multiple but this was like one national program everybody watching the same mm, thing sure um and then things like uh save the children's literacy boost uh was a good one as well because it meant um texts going regularly back into children's homes with a set of questions for a sibling or neighbor or a caregiver whoever um and that seemed to show so there okay you know, they're, they're piecemeal programs out there that do show um, some effect. Some success. Yeah. Okay. But I think, I mean, I think my ideas here have been formulated part in, a, in a number of ways. Firstly, around conversations around um, uh, possible things, existing resources, things that uh, don't add on to the system, um, but also um, a sense of what's happened um, in classrooms during COVID based on- Okay, uh, fair enough. Thanks, thanks a lot. Chetty, building on that, do your thing. But the question I want to ask you is, do we have a national response strategy for catch up? Mm -hmm. Okay, over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here, as you know, on uh, behalf of God and Kosa. Um, and uh, he's uh, apologized for missing the session. I'm sure he would have wanted to be uh, part of it. Um, I am going to use the time that we've got um, to do two things. Um, so I think the, 
the first answer, James, about uh, the recovery plan. Um, there was a very lively discussion, and as far as I know, acceptance of that, of a recovery plan presented at the DBE Lafota, which took place last week. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure our colleagues from the DBE, um, Ms. Modiba in particular, who's uh, director for GET curriculum, can tell us more about that. Yeah, she was involved in that discussion. So there are elements of, uh, I have a slightly different view of recovery because there may not be one single coherent plan uh, at this point, but I think there have been elements of that recovery plan um, that have been emerging, um, uh, that have been emerging uh, since, uh, since 2020, basically. Yeah, that's my, uh, that's my take on it. But it, I, I think there is a need certainly to communicate to the public and obviously to, to, to the system, yeah, a simple, coherent, clear set of directions as to where to go in the, uh, in the next uh, two to three years. So can I follow up? And sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting yeah, no, you, but no I'm trying to get the conversation going and yeah. avoiding the slides as far as I can. No um, do you think, how can I put this? Do you think um, what you're proposing there, Chetty, is going to accelerate us to catch up or is it going to get us back to where we were before in terms of, of pace? Because we, we need, I mean, the question I really have is there's been speak of a reset. Mm. Let's do a reset. This is a wake-up call. Let's do mm. a reset. Mm. Is what you saw at the Chotla last week and, and what you're talking about, is that a reset or is that getting back to what we had before COVID? Um, I think that the... Um, my impression of, of what's going on at the moment, I think that there's a co consensus that seems to be building around the idea of rebooting, um, of recovery, and building back better. Yeah. And maybe those, you know, sort of nice buzzwords that are easy to toss around, but those seem to, there seems to be some consensus um, uh, developing. Uh, around, uh, around those ideas. And I think what we need to see more of is what exactly are we going to be doing in each of those areas. I agree. I agree. Um, that is just not simply about um, uh, kind of doing a, um, a, as a palliative measure, but actually taking us beyond, no, exactly. uh, beyond where we are now. There's obviously short-term things which we need to be, we, we need to be doing, and there are other issues that need to be dealt with in the medium term. Agreed. Which is already, Agreed. Uh, mm. which is already going. So I've direction. eaten a little bit into your time, Chetty, so three or four minutes, if yeah. you're okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, not going, I'm going to put the lens back on the issue of learning losses for a minute, but not in the same way as the discussion we've had this morning, which was very illuminating. Um, for me, for us, the work that we've been, we've been involved in some work since, the, since November of last year, which we're going to carry on all the way through 2022, which is looking into time on task, looking into teaching and learning practices at school level, and looking at um, the way in which this recovery is or is not taking place. Yeah. And we're trying to, I mean, given that this, the, there, are, there are changes that are taking place, fortunately, at quite a pace now, um, the issue, hopefully, of, of the loss of teaching time, will, that, that issue will recede. Yeah. Uh, there, are no, there are no regulations yet from the DBE on the resumption of full-time face-to-face teaching for all grades, but that should come in the next, uh, that should come in the next few days after the cabinet decision. Um, I'm, I'm, so I'm going to focus a little bit on what we're seeing, what we were seeing in the system towards the end of 2021, and just put together some, some of the factors that I think we, uh, so, you know, some of the blockages, some of the things that are not quite adding up in the system uh, at the moment. Yeah. Um, I have a slightly different take on, I, I guess I should I have a slightly different take on um, the, uh, the measures that have been taken so far. I think the science has been good. We've done well to, 
we've done well to manage the system uh, to, on the management decisions to manage the system uh, 2020 and 2021 um, with regard to the pandemic. The issue is now getting it back on track um, in 2022. Um, and, that's, and that's the big challenge. Um, I, I'm, I might be, you know, uh, overstating the case a little bit, but I think um, policy instruments like curriculum change, no, I, in fact, I'm fairly sure, policy, policy instruments like curriculum change, such as what we've had, trimmed curriculum, recovery curriculum, ATPs, and other instruments that have been used, take time to embed themselves. You can't change those in six months and just say, get in line yeah, and see immediate changes. I think that's an important consideration. We, we, you know, we've really got to take that on board. Um, so we've got to see those, uh, we've, we've got to wait to see those kick in. So here's the, here's the, you know, here's the challenge. In the work that we were doing, which is a, a, to start off with a, uh, a, a group of, or a set of schools that we went into at the end of 2021 um, under you know, quite a lot of pressure because it was, uh, the timing was difficult, um, just under 300 schools, primarily second, sorry, mostly primary schools because we wanted to stay away from, uh, stay away from secondary schools at that time. These are some of the signals that we were getting from schools, heads of departments, teachers, um, about what was going on in schools. And we were trying to sort of pick up on those key indicators of, uh, pick up on some of the key indicators. So you can see here, the slide 74, you know, that, that high percentage of them um, tell, told us they could make up um, for lost time. You can see that, that they were using you know, in, as part of the recovery effort, they're using worksheets. They're, they say they're involving parents. And uh, which, where am I supposed to be pointing this to? That's um, Chitty, a minute. Sorry, well, pointed to there, where? Next slide. Oh, here we go. So the good news, that's the good news. And the good news, you know, there is some other good news, but then you get this kind of data coming out of the same coming out of the same schools. We're not talking about math here, but I'm just giving you a comparison. We looked in detail at the number of DBE worksheets used per week, per term. And the reason for this is twofold. The DBE workbook is a ubiquitous resource in the schools. It's one of the few things that every learner should have in every class. What we did is look at the number of worksheets that are actually being used. In math, it's easier. In the math curriculum, the recovery curriculum directs, instructs teachers to cover specific worksheets, work, worksheets week by week. Now, that's how it's designed. It, um, language is different, but that's one of the that, 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 that's the result of the analysis of what's going on. And I can show, basically you can see, that's term, that's term three. You can see what goes on week by week. And um, you can see what the usage is of these worksheets. So this is a critical resource, whether it's about revision in the classroom, whether it's about practice in the classroom, revision, homework, it gets used for multiple purposes. Now, that's why we picked on it. And what you can see particularly is during the assessment periods and the end of the term, what starts to happen in the utilization of these resources. Chitty, can I also Same. finish up? Yep. Same again with IFAL. And you can see the data there. There's, there's, this is like 33 slides, but I've only got five of them here. So you can see the same happening again in language teaching yeah? or the utilization of these resources. And you have to wonder why, what's going on? Why is it that these resources are not being used? The data is there on what we were getting. Last slide. The schools are telling us that they all use the DBE workbooks. They have access to the recovery ATP, that they can use it easily, and that it makes curriculum delivery more manageable. They tell us they're able to make make up for lost time. 
they report positive levels of support in their HODs. Yeah. So all those factors, tick, 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 tick. Yeah. What we get is a completely different story when we look at the amount of work actually being done by learners. So we've got DBE workbooks in place. We've got the recovery ATP in place, but this is what the outcomes look like. Our estimation is that about 40% at maximum of the work was being done in that term. And you can see the data there for math and ethyl. So this is, the, this, is, this is to us the challenge that needs to be cracked in 2022 whether it's about bringing back the kids to full-time face-to-face, which is non-negotiable now, it's about getting, it's about rebooting the system to get past these problems. Thank you. I'll Thank you, Chetty. Chetty, so just a quick follow-up. Um, Ushla spoke about um, teacher aids, um, teacher support, what did, I mean, the right name. Have you looked at teachers in any way, Chetty, in the work that you've been doing as the NECT and how teachers need to be supported? Um, Teacher development has continued in 2021, 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021. I think um, the big issue has been about downscaling, which has obviously had to happen uh, because we couldn't do it. It could not be done at the scale that it was done before. And I think the other dynamic, which we're not sure about, is the extent to which um, the extent to which the switch to virtual training. Hmm has the same longer term impact as uh, as face to face uh, as the face to face model there's no data yet that tells us anything uh, or that gives us any light on the, on that issue okay maybe just before my senior goes just one more question chetty um, the external evaluation of the NECT did anything come out there that is relevant for today sure and there is i think um, uh, there is a a widespread concern about the need for um, higher intensity and more sustained teacher development mm. rather than um, a you know rather than a model that is um, driven by uh, driven by numbers in the sense that uh, I mean if you I think there's you know that for one thing there there is incoherence in the way our professional development is is run mm. nationally and secondly it's very uh it's it, it's it, you know a, a part of that is the patchiness of it there's no sustained I funding agree. there's no mm. all of those things are okay are, are good point sync. i agree and that's that's come up in the evaluation okay great um Marsenia Nongamso is getting worried they're not gonna have any time sorry guys we're working at best you can so Marsenia uh, Vula Bula has already come up today so tell us a bit more about the work that you're doing Oh, thank you very much, James. Um, we maybe give us this next slide, please. It summarizes the issues that we're dealing with. Uh, our primary focus uh, is around those three issues, development of African language, African home language uh, literacy. And we have now even progressed into literacies because we have now included uh, numeracy into the, the mode. Uh, we also following a structured transition to English as first additional language. So we moved into biliteracy. The two languages uh, work together side by side, especially because of the transition at uh, grade three level. Uh, we also doing, and in the main, the development of uh, and provision of materials, teacher training and coaching to support the above. So the materials we, we in the main, we have been supplying and developing uh, Vula Bula graded readers in two ways, the individual graded readers as well as uh, the anthropologists, anthropologists, anthologies, uh, please. So yeah, and the, well, COVID has actually interrupt, interrupted everything, especially the foundation phase. And the main, the main issue, that we are still grappling with around the foundation phase is that when they are at home, there is no better way of dealing with them to the exclusion of the parents. And the parents are not always well endowed with resources as the teachers. So there have been disruptions and limitations on normal daily face-to-face -face classroom 
um, engagement. Face-to-face, uh, -face we know, is, is our primary uh, mode of engagement. And once you disrupt that, and at foundation level, it becomes a real crisis. Although we have always had a by, um, by what, bilateral mode of dealing with uh, the, the, the delivery, that is the face-to-face, -face, we always had that ICT complementary, and not as basic, but as complementary. The, there was severe impact on disadvantaged and impoverished communities where parents mostly lack the ability to support learning uh, remotely due to limited skills and resources. Uh, I'll talk about how we mediated this because then we were encouraging teachers to continue to work with the learners and the learners were under the custody of their parents and the teachers had the means and the parents did not have the means. I'll deal with that issue later on. Uh, estimates vary between a minimum of 50% and a maximum of an entire year. This I'll leave it, I mean, we got more accurate information about the losses that we had. So I think we can go to the next uh, slide, please. So the, just in terms of the, our areas of operation, the LTSM, how we mitigated some of the, the issues, uh, we, our, our materials development was not impacted negatively because materials development happens indoors, it's not out there in the field. So it continued successfully with the adoption of online communication tools such as Zoom, um, Teams, and, and so on. And our, team, our teams were very quick to adapt because it was not a new thing, except that now it was now becoming prominent. So our Vulabula website, uh, there you go, was endorsed by the DBE for zero rating. And we just accelerated the communication to the communities to say, you can access this website and you don't, have, you don't need data. And the, the, the sad thing about this is that um, the, the major, because we're using uh, Google Analytics to see who actually is visiting the website for how long, looking for what, and from where. So the, the, main, the main issue here was the majority of learners who visited our website were urban and peri-urban, to the exclusion of the rural people. And when we try to find out this is whether it's, it's zero rated, if you don't have a gadget, if you don't have a device, you just don't have it. And naturally, the majority of uh, foundation phase learners just don't have uh, the, 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 the devices. So uh, then with regard to training, um, we were also limited, uh, but we continued with our quarterly teacher training, uh, but it, the impact was limited because the most convenient and the most impactful is the, that face-to-face, -face, even if you complement it with ICT. But now we had to rely almost exclusively on uh, ICT, what you call remote uh, training, but it still continued. And we tried to, we also, you know, we changed our focus instead of, hammering the teachers with content. We also focused on COVID, pledging solidarity with them, showing them that we are also affected and we want to know how they were doing. And, and then as time progressed, we started to ask them questions. Now, if we're battling like this, where are the children? Can we find out where they are? Are we going to say it was COVID and therefore it's, it's bad luck? Then they started coming on board the teachers. Um, and one interesting discovery here is that we, we conducted some surveys and we realized that the, the majority of teachers are using devices, you know, smartphones, and, and therefore communication between them and us was easy. But the problem was the other side, like I, I explained towards the, to, to the parents. The coaching of foundation phase teachers, in particular, school-based support of teachers had to be reconceptualized with a far greater reliance on blended learning models using tablets and WhatsApp. The, the problem with 
with this is it was limited because then you wouldn't go be beyond this. You, since like assessment, you wouldn't, you know, kind of say with confidence that you have been succeeded. You have, you have succeeded. One minute, minute, please, my senior. And those are the projects uh, that uh, we were running between 20 and 21, and they're still except for uh, RSP, which has now come to the end, which was the end block, I mean, the USAID project. Can I interrupt you, Marcinia? A question, are you okay? Yeah. Uh, how's Maltino adapted as an NPO working in the space? Uh, in the work that you've been doing, how's the organization adapted? Um, the, I think the transition was not that radical uh, because the, as far as, as way back as 2011, 2012, we had started infusing ICT into our training. And therefore, when uh, pandemic, the pandi pandemic kicked in, yes, we were shocked, and those three months were really, we were, we were kind of puzzled a little bit, but we used that moment to engage with the funders to say there, is, there are other options that we can follow. So it was not a shock, except that you would not it's like you are now fast tracked, whereas we were progressing, you know, uh, slowly maybe into the ICT, but we were now forced to really jump and learn quickly uh, to, to do things uh, online. Uh, we haven't lost uh, uh, any project during that time. And in fact, I know that we, we got a new one, which is the UNICEF uh, project uh, last year. And so we, yeah, and we have been doing well, but we also got smart because then we knew that every time when the learners came and when the teachers came, we must make use of that moment uh, maximally mm -hmm. so that when they go, at least we have given them the package of what they're taking home and then we can engage with okay. them through Correct. ICT. So last comment from your side, otherwise Nom Gamsa is gonna throw me out here because she still needs to come. Last point, Masenia, from your side before we transition. Okay. The, the, our contribution in terms of material, LTSM, through Vula Bula, that is what we are offering to the nation. And, but what I want to mention is materials alone is not a solution. Mm. You can put them, put them in front of the teachers, but also help them to deal with the materials. Just, just if, I, if I may, uh, the, the Vula Bula, those who do not know, they are not just conventional storybooks. They are not just stories. They are stories that have been crafted along the orthography of individual African languages. So if you're having Vula Bula in your classroom and you don't know that aspect, then you're simply treating them as storybooks. But if you know the, the phonetic element of the, 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 the readers, then you're teaching reading through the, um, through the, 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 the stories. But at the same time, learners are still enjoying. I mean, you have this child who is having the sock at the back and he's still looking for it. But the, the thing is you are dealing with that sound. Yes. And so on. Yeah. Thanks, Masenia. Thank you. Okay, so we can give over to you now, just in case you were getting worried. Thank you. Came prepared, James, because our debate via emails, um, I, I anticipated that you would give us only five minutes. So I probably will only address three of some of your questions. Um, got three slides, just recommendations, um, and your other questions along uh, something about the system. But anyway, so I think we, we probably. Um, been going on, um, uh, Masinia, about Vula Bula. I think now, in particular, with the evidence that we have learned from the evaluation in the Eastern Cape, um, we are in conversations with our Western Cape just to demonstrate. I mean, I think also yesterday this was touched on um, in a sense of uh, costing this and budgeting this. Um, and this was part of um, a concept note or conversations with WCD regards to the possibilities of sort of scaling this and being part of their 
uh, recovery plan. And really what I'm trying to show here is norms and standards budget. Yes, I know this probably differs from province to province. Um, Western Cape specific sort of um, uh, norms and standards allocation and should um, they roll it out to the province, how much it would cost them um, uh, to sort of implement that. So at least from a, a, a cost perspective, if you look at how much uh, the province budgets for norms and standards and the cost of the anthology, it's less than 1%. The second one, um, the dual crisis, um, of using unemployment youth to improve, um, to improve learning outcomes. Um, again, with some of the evidence that we've seen, um, I, I mentioned this yesterday about the opportunity that uh, Department of Education um, has by uh, capitalizing on this unemployed youth that have been deployed in their classrooms as an effective um, or as an effective and also probably uh, to encourage improvements in, in, in learning outcomes. So probably unsaid, there's this question, is it gonna be extended for how long, when? Um, we don't know yet. I do believe that there are conversations um, and hopefully you know, it will be announced and, and, um, and, and hopefully not over hol school holidays, but more of when the education assistant or the reading champs are in the classrooms. But really here, what I'm trying to emphasize, should that confirmation comes, some of the considerations, um, sorry, uh, that within this program uh, to be considered as one, recruiting and screening effectively, training and supporting of the reading champs, uh, structured program uh, for the reading, reading champs to implement. Uh, so it's not just about, oh, we train you, but you get into the classroom and then what, what must I do? Um, but to also couple that to say, and I, I think the example that Ursula mentioned, this is what you are there to do, to support teachers with one-on-one -on -one reading or whatever the case is. And I think most importantly, and at least one that we've learned um, in our Limpopo intervention and, and through the work and supporting uh, DBE's uh, sort of initiative um, uh, is learning that the teacher, sort of teacher reading champs or TA, whichever term, um, orientation process is crucial. So not only you want the TA to know what to do, but the teacher also needs to know how to effectively use the TA to support um, uh, a teaching and classroom. So a third one is um, prioritization of core curriculum. Um, in my view, this is CAPS. Um, and I'm wondering how much of this big sort of uh, book consists out of sort of core reading skills materials. So if you're talking about catch up, at least, is to try and identify key core fundamental skills um, that is required for kids, um, at least to, to, you know, sort of move on to the next level. And with, okay, now there's no more limited time, but to, prior, to, prior, to prioritize that um, within the recovery plan. Some of the work that the team is doing um, has kind of looked at, and obviously in conversations, looked or analyzed the actual content. Um, we mentioned uh, ATPs, trimmed ATPs, version one, version two, version three, so on. Um, we've taken a look at all of these documents um, and really wanted to understand, you know, if there's, if there's trimming, reducing, I think in the DBE to Hokia, um, at, at Chetty, Dr. Polo uh, mentioned something of the reading recovery plan, having reduced content knowledge, having prioritization on functional skills. Um, and we, 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 we've looked at this and overall sort of um, our, our, from our review is that there is no less time in terms of the documents that we've analyzed, no simplification, no lessons of content, um, easing of, lesson, of content, um, but more help in spreading content across the term week by week, and no explicit help on how, how, how you assess. So although um, curriculum-wise, we've seen variations or versions of this, but it, to us at least, it seems same content, except in COVID. So our question is, at least from a content, a teaching perspective, you know, surely we should be re-looking at what are those core uh, foundational schools. Lastly, I promise James, um, so, so at least, We've seen a lot of plans. Um, earlier on, uh, Professor Nomo talked about slogans and documentations and 
and, and, and so forth. I think really what I would recommend um, to DBE is a systematically coordinated five to 10 year uh, reading strategy. And yes, with provincial autonomy, probably this would be challenging, but this sort of buffet style of we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this. Um, I think if we're trying to move the needle significantly, um, we probably need to look at more detailed, well-coordinated, system-wide um, interventions or plans. Plans that couple with implementation plans as well. Thanks, Nom Um, Quick question then, what, what is the role of Funda Wanda in, in all of that that you just spoke about? Um, so our role primarily, our mandate is from Rwanda, is to experiment and to explore, to build evidence so that we can sort of feed that into the broader system, whereas probably government um, does not have the time. I mean, they, they're under pressure to respond now, to give a response now. Um, so we really do see ourselves as an experimenting ground and, of course, supporting initiatives um, that government already has in place. Okay, great. Okay, colleagues, we've got about five minutes left, so can we take a quick round of uh, questions? We'll give you a quick chance. I think we did, didn't do too badly on the time. Right at the back there, somebody got the mic going around. Go for it. Um, thank you, colleagues, for your suggestions for, for, for recovery plans. Um, I think... Um, some are good uh, suggestions, and I'm just wondering if if this is open for other organizations or people working in the literacy uh, with language and literacy to make their own suggestions as well to add to the suggestions that are being made here. But I also want to just um, comment on the suggestions. I think Ashla, you made this suggestion about using life skills to read the Bula Bula books. Um, my comment here relates to the fact that if we are to prioritize decoding in literacy, in the literacy time, then we can't also just use materials that support decoding in the, liter in the life skills time, because um, we know that decoding extracts knowledge and focuses on letter sounds. So we want children to learn other things beyond just um, the decoding. So it would, it would be important for books that include stories, real stories that capture children's imagination to be used in that time, in the, in, in the life skills time, if we are to use that time for that. Okay. Um, earlier in the session, people made a call for oral literature, literature and if it's not oral, then there are books that have taken the oral literature and put it into books, like, for example, Nelson Mandela's favorite stories for children. It's an anthology of 33 stories for children that can be read in, in that time, which is then that means you expand this kind of reading because the readers are meant for children for learner reading program. But we also want a teacher reading program that extends the children's knowledge of reading and stories Thank and you. imagination. Thank you. That point's well taken. Can I take one more comment? And then we also want to give the lady there. Thank you. Two ladies there, or just the one. <laughs> I wanted to ask, thank you so much to everyone. I wanted to ask, um, Sir Chetty, no? is there a timeline on when we can expect a cohesive, coherent reboot or catch up plan from the department? I think it's such an urgent question, I'm not feeling really resolved in it. And so. Okay, fair question. Let's take one more, then we'll, mm, lots of other hands coming up now. I'll take one more, yeah. Yes, go for it. Okay, so, so I wanted to, first of all, um, respond to what Kathy was talking about, about our phonics being too slow. Ne? So as a grade three teacher, when a child comes from grade two, grade one and grade two and can't read, you don't have the luxury of two years. So you make sure, you, you teach that very quickly, very fast. So it has been done. It's just that we need to find from the teachers who have done it, how have they done it? One. Two, um, Ursula's recommendation about dropping life skills, Ish, that child that is being. Um, my, 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 my thing is, um, if we're talking psychosocial issues, those are life skills issues, right? And the children just got back from having two days, three days of free time, and they come back into the classroom and we expect them to concentrate for the whole day, good luck. Right. So what what we can do is use that physical education time for movement and 
integrating it with the phonics that we have. Uh, and lastly, uh, it would be nice to use the EAs. The five months that we have is short, right? But um, in the schools that we work with, some choose to volunteer after the five months is over. So I think that is really a missed opportunity. Mm. I'm hearing a lot of debates I've heard for the last 20 years. And I'm just wondering, guys, when are we going to really get our act together and accelerate this? Uh, and Osha, I think some of the stuff you put in there on purpose because you knew it's been spoken about for a long time. I'm just like, are we as an education community ready to move this ahead quicker? And I'll just talk about the same thing, reading wars, um, life orientation, do we need in the curriculum? CAPS curriculum is too long. You know, it's like we've spoken about this for a long time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how do we then in this uh, possible scenario try to harness the wealth of literature that we have? I know we said there's little in African literature, but you have a lot in websites like the Said website, the stories written uh, by African teachers, and you have organizations writing stories through children. And can't you have a source of a resource where we have all of these materials together and also encourage teachers to produce stories from their context, which are so meaningful and can be taught and interesting and encourage children to read for pleasure and for meaning. Thank you. Thank you. And then the last comment right in front of you, ma'am, and then we'll be done. Thanks. Mine's a follow up from the question to Chetty around the timeline for the catch up plan. I just wanted to know if there was talk around uh, budgets and what kind of allocations for implementation. Okay. And in defense of Chetty, Chetty is representing the NECT and not the DBE, so I'm protecting you from the outset. Okay, guys, a last comment each. And there are other things that we've got departmental officials with us that can answer a lot of these questions, and maybe there'll be more opportunities for that. So guys, last comment each, I'm not even gonna ask you a question, like I don't know what to ask. Shall we go, Ursula, you start to go around. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say one thing, that, and that is that one of the problems with, um, with COVID, and I think it's been spoken about this morning, is the fact that it affected different schools very differently. And I think that that's one, been one of the big challenges for the DBE in trying to work with the curriculum in that, it's so different both across schools and within schools. But I don't think we can get around the fact that the curriculum has to be cut. It has to be trimmed, less so in the foundation phase. And I don't, I mean, I, the, cutting life skills doesn't stop teachers from doing stuff with them in the home language, from jumping up and down. But in the other, in the other, at the other levels, we have to think about content cuts and the suspension okay. of... Point taken. Um, Good point. Yeah. From Gamsel. Um, this feels like a, a SABC interview, eh? Does, Go for it. It really does. <laughs> but I think probably uh, what my takeaway is try to do less by doing more. Okay, fair enough. Um, As yeah. in, you're trying to perfect 21 things on the list, do five things very well. Not sure. I mean, principle well taken. Chetty, NECT, not DBE. Sure. Tell us more. Sure. Thank you. Uh, James, if I can just be a little bit out of order here. Two things. Um, we are lucky to have Dr. Mbude. We're lucky to have Dr. Mbathele. We're lucky to have Ms. Kutiba. These are the people that run the system, including Stephen and Umi. So I'm sure they can give us a better idea of what's happening at provincial level, which is where the action is in terms of recovery. They were all part of the decision-making process at the Lekota, at the national Lekota. So I'm asking for permission if no, if, sure. if uh, Ray, uh, Dr. Mbude, and the rest of us. So we'll come back to it. Um, do you want to take it now? Yes. Okay, we'll come back to it. <laughs> Let's just finish this first. Same now. Right. Let's just finish but this first. I'm already the, out of time. The second oh, is that the the second is that um, the minister is doing a civil society consultation tomorrow at starting at nine o'clock. Okay, that's good. So we can easily make sure that anyone, everyone in this room gets invited to it. It's the perfect time perfect. to pitch the question and answer mm. this now. Thanks, Chetty. Masenya. Oh, thank you. Um, going back to the issue of Vula Vula materials, uh, the whole point of making them freely available is to make them uh, accessible to the learners. And if 
if you you can print them, but if you print them with a an expensive printer, then it's defeating the whole process. So we we do offer uh, internal in-house uh, printing. You can try us first before you go wild. Thank you. Thanks, my senior. I'm sorry for running a bit late with the session. We just start 15 minutes later, so we're done. Thank you for your time. My, my parting shot would just be like, can we coordinate better across government and civil society and funders? I think that's the real need we have in the country. We've tried during the COVID period, but I think we can do more. And we're here to support each other. We're not here to, as I started out today, to take each other to court. That doesn't help anybody. And so let's engage each other before we get to that point so we can take meaningful decisions and move things forward. Thank you very much. And uh, over to the next panel. I'm sorry I short-circuited you a bit.